So a lot of you guys got off to the right start with this one. So we know that we have five grams of aluminum and we know that most of the time in chemistry problems, we wanna be working not with grams, but with what? Yeah, so the first thing we're gonna do is get that five grams into moles. If I can get my pen to cooperate with me today. Okay, so most of you got this far, and that's great. So now we know how many moles of aluminum we have. So the next question is, do we know anything about the relationship between moles of aluminum in this reaction and the amount of heat produced by this reaction? The answer is yes, because we have a balanced reaction. And in addition to a balanced reaction, we've got this new piece of information, this delta H. Okay, so we can think of delta H as heat, but what's the more correct term for delta H? Enthalpy. So the word enthalpy has this really awkward H in it, and that's how I remember that enthalpy is the delta H of the reaction. We say heat a lot, and it's most of the time the same. depends on the conditions that we're under, but delta H is really the enthalpy of the reaction. What does it mean that it's a negative number? It's releasing heat, and there's a fancy word we use for that, which is exothermic, okay? And that makes sense based on the way the question is worded. It's asking us how much heat is released, on the reaction of these five grams of aluminum. So all I'm gonna do is I'm going to treat this enthalpy almost like a product of the reaction, right? Because it's being released as this reaction proceeds. So I'm gonna use this mole ratio that every time two moles of aluminum reacts, I know that negative 1408.4 kilojoules of heat, well, the negative is kind of redundant, but 1408.4 kilojoules are released. So the way that that conversion factor is gonna look is that it's going to be two moles of aluminum on the bottom okay now I know you guys are used to doing with molar masses that it's always one mole that weighs that much but when we're doing this <coughs> enthalpy we need to look at what the balanced reaction says the balanced reaction does not say negative 1408 for one mole of aluminum it says negative 1408 for two moles of aluminum. So you have to check the balanced reaction when you do that. Any questions about why I'm using two moles of aluminum there? All right. So you should be able to plug that into your calculators. How many significant figures am I rounding this to? Three. So you should have negative 130 kilojoules. Um, if they're asking you how much heat is released, you may not have to enter the negative sign because the negative sign kind of implies release. So you wouldn't say negative 130 kilojoules released. You would just say 130 kilojoules released. So just be aware of that when you do your master in chemistry, that if the word release is in the question stem, sometimes they don't want the negative. And I know they're not always very consistent about that, but if you're really struggling with a problem, it might be because the negative is implied and you don't have to write it in. But it is actually negative 130 because, like you told me, it's an exothermic reaction. Um, another question for you guys. Why didn't I have to worry about a limiting reactant in this problem? Yeah, and they don't explicitly tell you that, so we're just kind of assuming that because they didn't tell us anything about the chlorine. Okay? If they had given us an amount of chlorine, this would essentially be a limiting reactant problem because we'd want to figure out which one of these we're running out of. But they didn't tell us, so we can assume all we need to worry about is the aluminum. That is something, I graded your exams, and some of you guys for the first question on the exam got really excited about limiting reactants, but there wasn't one because they only give you information about one uh, starting reactant. So just keep that in mind. Any questions about this problem? Anything unclear? All right, you wanna try one a little bit harder? So when we talk about PV work, we should be thinking about this equation, W equals negative P delta V. Okay, it's W equals negative P W V. 
uh, delta B. So the W stands for work. What is P going to stand for? Pressure. Pressure and delta B. Change in volume. Okay. So they give us these numbers in the problem. It's fairly straightforward to plug these in. So when they tell us that we're at atmospheric pressure, what number should we be using? One atmosphere, you guys might be doing it in Pascal's, but Pascal is very close to an atmosphere, so I'm just going to use one atmosphere. Um, so I've got negative one ATM, that's an atmosphere. And then what is the change in volume they're giving me? Yeah, negative 5.6 liters. Okay, so if you multiply that together, you're going to get a positive number, and it's going to be positive 5.6 liter atmospheres. That is the unit, liters times atmospheres, because that's exactly what I multiplied together, units of liters and units of atmospheres. Now, ultimately, I need to be talking in terms of energy units, and a liter atmosphere is not an energy unit. So there's a conversion factor we use to get between liter atmospheres and energy. So that conversion factor looks like this. I've got my 5.6 liter atmospheres and there are 101.3 joules for every one liter atmosphere. And so that's a conversion factor that's gonna take my PV work and get it into an energy unit for me. I'll kind of worry about my six pigs at the end here. So let's talk about the sign of work real quick and make sure that that makes sense. So you told me that P delta V, my delta V is negative. So what does that mean about the volume of the container that my reaction is in? Delta V is negative. Am I crushing it or am I expanding it? crushing it. So my delta V change in volume is negative. It's getting smaller. Okay. So when we talk about work, we talk about the system doing work on the surroundings or the surroundings doing work on the system. All right. If I am moving my volume down, if I'm crushing my container, who's doing the work? Surroundings or system? Surroundings, surroundings are crushing my container, right? So when we have the surroundings doing work, the sign of W is positive. And that makes sense with the calculations we've just done. All right, so that's why the equation is negative P delta V, because we always try to think about things from the point of view of the system. And from the system's point of view, work was being done to it. All right, so that's how we know we're on track with our units and our sign for that one. So that takes care of the first part of that. The second thing they're asking us is they want the value of delta E in kilojoules. So in order to figure out the value of delta E, we should know this relationship, that delta E is equal to Q plus W. We just decided that W is work, and we already did that half of it, so we're good. And Q would be what? So Q is related to heat, okay? Q is not always the same as delta H, but in constant pressure conditions, we can use them interchangeably. So make sure you check out that section of your textbook and you're sure when we can. But at constant pressure conditions, we can say that Q is equal to delta H. All right, so do you guys remember me saying that delta H really means enthalpy, but sometimes we just call it heat, and that most of the time it's fine to call it heat? The reason it's fine to call it heat most of the time is that under most conditions that chemists work under, we're at constant pressure, okay? And what would that constant pressure be? You walk into a lab, do an experiment, what constant pressure are you under? Atmospheric. Yeah, atmospheric pressure and specifically one atmosphere of pressure, okay? So for the most part, everything we do as chemists, we can assume is under constant pressure conditions and under constant pressure conditions, we can say that Q is going to be equal to delta H. So we're making an assumption there, and this is why you need to be kind of careful with your vocabulary. So constant pressure, Q equals delta H, and the way we can write that 
is that Q P equals delta H. So that's just the notation way of saying is that under constant pressure, Q, heat, is the same thing as delta H. Okay, we already practiced calculating delta H. So you guys should be pretty familiar with that. Only thing we have to worry about this time is you notice that they're giving us information about both reactants. They're giving us information about hydrogen and they're giving us information about oxygen. Did you figure out which one of those is limiting? Both or none. How do you know that? Yeah, so you can see that I've got a two to one ratio, right? I've got twice as many moles of hydrogen as I do of oxygen. And according to the balanced chemical reaction, I use twice as many moles of hydrogen as I do of oxygen. So what this means is that essentially they're both limiting or neither one's limiting, but basically it doesn't matter which one I work with because they're both going to give me the same result. So it doesn't matter which one you used, but you need to identify why it doesn't matter which one you used. And it doesn't matter because they're essentially both or neither limiting. All right, so moving forward here, I'm going to go ahead and use the 5 moles of H2. I'm going to do the same thing we did last time. I know that for every 2 moles of H2, negative 484 kilojoules of heat. Make sure you put that number two in the bottom because this is what the balance reaction tells me, that for every two moles of H2 reacting, 484 kilojoules of heat are released. So you should end up with negative 121 kilojoules. Are we good with that? Any questions so far? All right, all that's left is to turn this into a delta E. I've already given you the equation for that, so I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to do it before I do it. So do it, check with your neighbor. So that should hopefully match with your work. Pay very careful attention to the units. When I did the math for W, my final answer was in joules. Okay? Since they're asking for this in kilojoules, I just need to make sure that I convert my joules to kilojoules, and then I do the math. Notice how much smaller the value of W is than Q. So it essentially doesn't matter. You'll notice that we tend to ignore it for most reactions, but that's how we would calculate delta E. So like every problem, there are multiple ways to do it. A lot of you guys are finding a bunch of equations in your notes, and that is perfect. Um, I prefer not to rely on equations because my brain gets kind of full. So it's helpful for me to think about why I'm doing problems the way I'm doing them. So when I think about specific heat capacity, I want to think about a definition of what that means. So does anyone have a definition in front of them or have something floating around in their head that they like? What does specific heat capacity mean to you? Okay, so it's related to the mass, but what about the mass? What does it tell me about a substance if I know it's specific heat capacity? Yeah, okay. So a heat capacity in a very general sense tells me the capacity I have for absorbing heat, right? It's exactly what it sounds like. So a heat capacity says, how much heat energy can you absorb before you begin to change temperature? So if you look at your equation for heat capacity, it's going to have temperature change, okay? So it's going to be how much heat can you absorb, which is going to be energy. So that's heat capacity in general, okay? When we talk about a specific heat capacity, I am specifically asking about it in terms of grams of a substance. So that's how I go from heat capacity to specific heat capacity. I don't just want to know in a general sense, I want to know per gram of a substance. So a specific heat capacity, or sometimes just called a specific heat, is related to how much energy can you absorb per gram before you begin to change temperature. What would a molar heat capacity be then? 
What do you think? Yeah, it's the same thing as specific heat, but instead of grams, we're doing it in moles, okay? So now I understand how these are all related, I can think about the units. If the specific heat capacity tells me how much energy I can absorb for a gram of a substance, looking at my temperature change, all right, I should be able to figure out the units. What units are energy in? Yeah, so if I know that I need joules of energy, grams, and degrees Celsius, that essentially tells me how to put all this information together. Because I know it takes 89.7 joules to raise 33 grams of the substance, 5.2 degrees C. That's all I'm doing, is I'm using the information they gave me and the units I know that specific heat capacity is supposed to have to do the math. So that's all it looks like. I know that to raise 33 grams of my substance, 5.20 degrees, it's gonna cost me 89.7 joules. So when you do that out, you should get a number that looks like 0.523. And again, this is the same number you're gonna get by following through the equations, but it's helpful to understand why the equations are reasonable, that way you're not so much memorizing them as just using that. So that's things to keep in your brain, all right? Now we need to change that to a molar heat capacity. All right, so the only difference between a specific heat capacity and a molar heat capacity is using grams versus using moles. Do we know how to change from using units of grams to using units of moles? Yeah, what piece of information do you need? That's all you need. So you're just gonna use the molar mass to convert units essentially. So if I know that it's 0 0.523 joules per gram degree C, and I know that for titanium, and I don't have this memorized, so you probably had to look it up, it's 47.9-ish, sorry, grams per one mole. Your units of grams are gonna go away, you're gonna be left with units of moles, and your heat capacity is going to get larger, and now you should have something like 25.0 joules per mole degree C. Yeah? Uh, period table. I looked it up. That's the molar mass of titanium. Okay, so in this problem, we're looking for the enthalpy of the reaction, and the enthalpy of the reaction is like the delta H of the reaction, and Rxn is just a way to abbreviate reaction. And so when we do this using the heats of formation, which are delta H F values, the equation for this is that we're gonna sum up, that's what the sigma means, the delta H of formation values for the products, And we're going to subtract that from the sum of the delta H of formation values of the reactants. So what we want to do is we want to match up the delta H of formation values for each of those substances. So for C2H4, we can see that the heat of formation is 52.5 kilojoules per mole. For C2Cl6, we see that it's negative 134.2 kilojoules per mole. And for HCl, it's negative... 92.3 kilojoules per mole. Now you'll notice that no information is given about Cl2, and the reason that no information is given about Cl2 is that Cl2 is in its standard elemental state. So if you find chlorine, it's going to be a diatomic gas. That means that its enthalpy of formation or its heat of formation is going to be zero kilojoules per mole. So when you're working a problem like this and they give you the list of all the heats of formation for various substances, if you ever feel like you're missing one, it may be because it's zero because you've got something in its standard state. So that's always a good thing to check if you feel like you're inf missing information in this type of problem. Okay, so at this point, we are ready to plug in the information. So again, we're calculating the delta H value for the entire reaction. First, we're gonna add together the delta H values for all of the products. And what you wanna pay attention to here 
is that this is kilojoules per mole, okay? So since we only have one mole of the C2Cl6, we just need to add one of those in. So that's going to be one negative 134.2 kilojoules per mole. And then I'm gonna add that to the delta H formation for the HCl. But you'll notice that for the HCl, I have four moles of it according to the balanced reaction. So when we write this, it's going to be four moles times the negative 92.3 kilojoules per mole. So we've got that extra factor of four in for the HCl because of the balanced reaction. So that's gonna be our products. So we're gonna add those together and that's gonna be the sum of the delta H formation of the products. And we are going to subtract that from the delta H formation for the reactants. Remember that we don't have to worry about Cl2 because five times zero is zero. So all we're gonna to need to write in here is the 52.5 kilojoules per mole for the C2H4. And since we've only got one mole of that, essentially we're multiplying by one, so we don't need to worry about doing any extra math there because 52.5 times one is still 52.5. So you notice that we have a very large negative number for the delta H of the products because we've got negative 134.2 plus four times negative 92.3. So we're gonna have a very large negative number, and then we're gonna subtract an additional 52.5. So we should end up with a fairly large negative number, and that number should be negative 556 kilojoules. And I'm using three significant figures there.